Hello and welcome to the RTE Soccer Podcast Daily World Cup edition. Mikey Stafford here, joined by Connor Neville. Um, the first day of quarterfinals has gone on so long, I think every RTE pundit has mm. gone to bed. So me and Connor have just decided there was so much football today, Connor. I don't think we need any help. I forget who played the first game, was it? <laughs> um, it was Accrington, Stanley and Tranmere, I think. Yeah, it's it's been quite a day. Um, I have to say, though, Connor, I am. First of all, that was the thoroughly enjoyable game of not very good football that um, Argentina and the Netherlands served up there, which really shouldn't have gone to extra time. But the Argies obviously just wanted a little bit more. Uh, practice. There's, there's, a, there's a growling desire to Argentina, now, really, isn't it? I mean, we we saw it in the Mexico game, which was a very um, scrappy, ill-tempered game. Primarily, I suppose the Mexicans dictated a lot of that, but I thought Argentina's um, uh, <laughs> sort of the simmering aggression in that game was incredible. And I think Argentina drove most of it, to be honest, particularly after they went ahead, they tried to shut Holland down. There were a few heavy challenges. Well, P- Paredes drilling the ball Paredes into the Dutch drilling, well, dugout. Well, that, that I mean that was just gratuitous. I mean that was, I mean clearly, I mean the the sort of moral outrage of the Dutch bench. You know, they couldn't they couldn't both charge out there. You know, they pretty much had to. And I, I thought, I mean, Scaloni at the end. I mean, there, there there have to be some sort of repercussions for what he did at the end of uh, normal time. I would have thought. I mean, he he he. He chased down the ref. It was reminiscent. I don't know if uh, our World Cup podcast viewers are familiar with Tommy Kerr, uh, vein throbbing uh, in his forehead, screaming in the face of Mick Curley in a uh, All Ireland quarter final several years ago. But it, it reminded me almost of that. I mean, it, it was it, there was total anarchy for a lot of the latter part of that game. And uh, yeah, that's reflected in the number of cards. I'm seeing a couple of different I, I, tallies, yeah. but. We're looking at 18 yellows and one red. A lot of people may not be aware that Denzel Dumfries was sent off during the penalty shootout. He picked up the second yellow card I didn't for, know that either. for 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 Lippen. And uh, Scaloni was booked, as was another coach. But he'd have to be more booked. I mean, for that. I mean, he 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 chased him down. I mean, the ref had to really backtrack. I mean, I I was baffled by it. Well, baffled. I suppose they were sickened by the finale of the game, but. I, I don't think Argentina had much cause to be annoyed at the ref. I mean, I thought on balance, what mistakes were made favoured Argentina. So. Oh, w- w- without a doubt, it seems, you know, your conspiracy theorists will say that this was a referee, Spanish referee, Matteo Lajos, Laz, I won't pretend to yeah. pronounce his name, um, was sent out with the express, <laughs> with the express, um, he had one task, make sure Leo, Leo Messi makes it to the World Cup semi-final. It wasn't quite that, yeah, right. it wasn't that blatant, but anybody watching would have thought, what has this ref got against the Dutch, or mm. what, 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 why is he so fond of the Argentinians? Because, it, it, look, it, it was just mental, and it was you know the argentinians undid themselves at the end of normal time um yeah. with that you know, kind of the brain dead foul on the edge of the box which led to oh yeah otamendi doesn't there yeah i mean it's absolutely crazy Bra- brain dead's my name for otamendi sorry I, I knew who it was that, that that's my that's my pet name for him <laughs> he's as brave as a lion but um about as and yeah. uh, totally needless and you know uh, yeah I think Man City fans will be shaking their heads saying, yep, that's that's him. You could call him brainless or totally needless, both good names. But anyway, the free was very nicely worked. The ball yeah. slid in to uh, Wout Veghorst, uh, who's still on the books of Burnley, but currently playing his trade in Turkey. With he, was, he, was, he, he was extraordinarily pumped up. For he that was. Period. No, the first I, goal I, was a more be- a Veghorst goal. It was a towering header. Bounced super header. And then, you know, he finished that and... You know, he, he looked to be spoiling for a fight too as well when he when he came on. I was he still on the bench when Paredes, you know, tried to boot the ball, and tried to decapitate someone with the ball. I mean, he, he, there was a sense that he was simmering when he came on, and I at the end of full time, um, normal time, uh, you could see Van Gaal and Danny Blind both seemed to be trying rather than congratulating him for you know rescuing their world cup essentially he, they seem to spend they seem to decide they had an imperative to try and calm him down because he, 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 was, he <laughs> his level of intensity was unsustainable i think yeah. they had figured out with extra time still coming no no the paredes 
great news. Volley uh, came just before the end of normal time, 89th minute, I think. Um, like he, he, you could argue he could have got a red card for the hatchet job on Nathan Ake uh, and a red card for booting the ball at about 90 miles an hour into the dugout. But the ref gave me a yellow card for the two combined, which which was quite generous. The ref also failed to book Leo Messi for the most blatant handball of all time. Blatant handball. There was another kind of uh, very clever um, rear end hunch of it in the air that he let Messi away with. I mean, Messi seems to have some sort of immunity from prosecution for reasons we can speculate, we can guess at, I suppose. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't mean there's any conspiracy. I think it's just these subconscious natural bias towards someone of Messi's status that's that's applying here to be honest uh yeah I, I like I, I do think there's there's a feel there, there's a feeling with me at least of not so much Messi but if we were to end up with the Dutch winning that game and you know yeah. Port- Portugal winning tomorrow and one of England or France and having four European teams in the semi-finals I I that that would have been a disappointment to me as good as those teams might be for the world cup you do kind of feel you want you want another continent represented in the last I, sh- and I suspect given the sort of the the composition of the uh traveling fans out there fifa would particularly wanted i mean it was it was <laughs> it was essentially an argentina home game and there was even that small sliver of dutch fans you could see um yeah, on the right side because I think the Dutch may have won the toss and the shootout and up to to go in. I was, it was the people were saying they were they were going down to take the penalties in front of their fans, but of course it was still primarily Argentina fans. Down there. <laughs> yeah, the, the, they the, just the... occupied a little enclosure in the uh, the little orange enclosure in the corner there. Yeah, so it, it's hard not to talk just about the extra time and the chaos that came in the last ten minutes of the game, but we should mention that. Um, there were, you know, Argentina did take a two goal lead thanks largely to, to Leo Messi. He did, uh, Molina scored the first goal, but uh, Messi's slide rule pass is getting the bulk of the credit. The the Atletico Madrid, the, the, the Atletico Madrid full back not getting a whole lot of credit, even though it was a lovely touch and a great finish. Great but finish, it was a, yeah. a no look pass that bisected about six five Dutch defenders is going to get anyone a lot of credit. But when it's Leo Messi, it's magnified, I can say. Yeah. And then he scored a penalty as well, uh, a very nice penalty. Um, and then he also, which is kind of difficult, you know, the whole um, Robbie Keane 2002 thing, scoring a penalty in in regulation and then taking one in the shootout. Do you do the same thing again, etc.? He didn't, yeah. but um, he completely... Well, it was similar technique again in the sense that he waited for the keeper to sort of... Yeah, it went the other way. Yeah, he, 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 he can do that. Pundits give out about the shuffle and, you know, the stalled run up. And when it goes wrong, obviously, you can give out about it. But you never get a sense. I know he missed a penalty earlier in the tournament. When Messi does it right, you get the impression like, oh, well, that's the easiest way to take a penalty. Everyone should take yeah. a penalty like that. It looks yeah. so easy because um, he had poor Noppert um, completely bamboozled. But then having got into a 2 0 lead, uh, Argentina then conspired to allow uh, Wout Weghurst to um score two goals and um all chaos broke out at full time as you said but then in extra time again argentina played all the football it was like for 12 minutes at the end of normal time they just let the dutch into it it was it was not it was a performance i'd say the Cro- the croatians if they're still awake the poor old guys could be exhausted and you know mm. pull a comp plan and off to bed but they they would be kind of encouraged to think you know that argentina have the this ability to, um, well, in terms of discipline, it's obviously encouraging, but also the fact that they just kind of collapsed with the finish line in sight. They're revealing obvious vulnerabilities all the way through Argentina, all right. Yeah, I thought both te- Argentina deserved to win. They made most of the running. They were the more uh, industrious, enterprising team throughout. The Dutch offered really very little for most of the game. And then um, in a very... I mean, Van Gaal is getting a lot of credit for the throwing Veghurst on or whatever. But I mean, it was a very uncomplicated sort of approach that <laughs> uh, re- rescued the situation for them. You know, you're you're used to Van Gaal talking about his philosophy the whole time, and yet what rescued them there was a very uh, primitive form a, of football. A very like, tall man. 
Never. <laughs> I'm not sure Van Gaal can chalk this to his superior football, you know, super brain here, to be honest. But no. uh, uh, yeah, Argentina deserved to win. I thought both teams were pretty flawed in lateral. I mean, I, I covered the Dutch a lot earlier in the tournament in terms of minute by minutes and whatnot. And I wasn't terribly blown away by them, I have to say. I mean, they were lucky enough to beat Senegal and were quite lucky to draw with Ecuador. So they had been defensively solid early on, but, the, you know, the the, high, the pitch, there was seemed to be very little going on. It was all a bit cumbersome and lacking in fizz and real real energy. I mean, they, they, they played reasonably well against America, who, which was seemed like a dangerous game in prospect. In prospect mm. of the uh, sort of uh, the uh, counter-attacking game, which they cut them up with, and it worked very well that day. But Today they were. I oh, prior to Veghorst coming on, you would have said Holland were Netherlands were exiting the tournament quite limply. Now in the end, it was anything but limp. It was a, a furious rally at the death, and I'm sure they'll win credit for that, and they should, I suppose. Mm. It's it's a relatively stirring way to exit the competition as it happened, but you wouldn't have said that up until 15 minutes remaining. Yeah, and, and there is that sense of. The Dutch aren't quite living up to their lofty past. I mean, yeah, well, they 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 haven't for some time. Yeah, I was about maybe. to say their recent yeah. past hasn't been lofty at all. Yeah. But it's yeah. a very it's a very young team. Um, it's Ronald Koeman's turn to manage the Dutch team. There's, like, I think, since the Second World War, I think about three men have managed the Dutch team on rotation. Is that right? Yeah, there's minus just... Michel's dick. <laughs> It just seems like they just take it in turns uh, to go in and out. Uh, so Kuman's back in now. And, you know, you wouldn't bank against them doing well in Germany in a couple of years' time because they are a young team. they got some great... Like Nathan Aki had a great World Cup, we were just saying earlier. Yeah, well, I was admiring Aki. I thought he was excellent throughout the tournament. Uh, and with the hair, he, he did I... something with the hair. Aki does look quite like a young Ruth Hullet now as well, which can't do any harm. Certainly. And I did I did enjoy I mean one thing I did enjoy about the Dutch was their magnificently uh suited and distinguished looking uh, bench. You know, it was constant zoom ins on Van Gaal and Davids and Danny Blin sitting there. They reminded me there was something very uh it reminded me almost of those Neffet committees. There was something <laughs> very serious and impressive looking about them. Okay. Time. Because you're comparison making comparison with Scaloni, this this kind of little scamp yeah. by comparison in a tracksuit. You know. did, did it remind you at all of, of the, the Euro 2020 uh, Italian winning uh, backroom team who were always oh. were they too well turned out that they wouldn't they be were, quite they were, they were grotesquely stylish. They were they, they, they were, were really they were lavish. I mean, I would say the Dutch was more was more um, conservative but distinguished. Okay, Bus business as opposed to the yeah. Italians who are more kind of, um, yeah. you know, may maybe down the Cote d'Azur or the, uh, yes. Yeah. The Nobel Prize Committee or whatever. Um, dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, it's, it's, it's turning out to be a good World Cup for goalkeepers. Um, yeah. We'll move on to the earlier game now, which in the mists of time uh, finished 4-2 on penalties to Croatia against uh, Brazil with... Um, Livakovic, he only saved one this time. He didn't save three, like in the last round. And then Marquinhos um, belted one off the inside of the post. Always a particularly painful way to lose a penalty shootout. He only, like, he literally missed by an inch. If the ball had been an inch to yeah. the right, it goes in, and it's the best penalty ever. Alan Shearer esque whip on it, but he didn't. He hit the post. And Brazil, Connor, you'll know this because you're a fan of history, football or otherwise. In 2002, in the knockout stages, uh, Brazil bet Belgium, England, Turkey, and Germany, four UEFA teams to win their last World Cup. Uh, 2006, they beat Ghana before going out to France. Mm -hmm. 2010, they beat Chile before going out to the Netherlands. 2014, they beat Chile again and Colombia before going out uh, to Germany, Germany famously 7-1. And then in 2018, uh they beat uh who they beat mexico and then they went out to belgium they haven't we are it's famously known now but it's just like there's an exclamation point put against it that croatia have been added to this list of european teams who have sundered brazilian hopes and i would say that you look back at some of those teams 
2014 was a good team, but Neymar was out injured and it caused like a, a psychic rift through the whole country, never mind the squad. But, you know, like they, they weren't all great teams, you know, like you're talking the Brazils of Oscar, Fred and Bernard, Bernard here, you know, that was 2014 famously, the three, the three lads. This was a good Brazil team. Or yeah. are we constantly guilty of hyping up Brazil because A, they're Brazil and B, they have great attacking individuals, but they're just, there seems to be something lacking or are we looking too deeply? There must, I mean, there's, there's a feeling of deja vu, all right, of the way they keep floundering. Now, with the exception of the Germany game, which was a sort of garish uh, spectacle. And I think a particularly poor Brazilian team that year. Yeah. That was a poor Brazilian team, yeah. but and also a, an utterly fantastic German performance yeah. that yeah. one. Like, there's no getting away from the fact that Germany <laughs> like ate them yeah. on toast and would have probably done the same thing to most any country in the world that night. Yeah, e- excluding that game. I mean, the last three, the Dutch, it was it was similar to the Dutch in 2010, and it kind of felt similar to Belgium four years ago. In some, now, I still think Brazil should have done it. Had, they had enough to win the game, and they should have won the game. I do think it was. I do think if you if you look at the players individually, how they're doing club wise, and you you examine it in depth, it it does look like a better Brazil team than recent models. But they they haven't done enough to eke it out. And I'm going to claim vindication for our uh, our our podcast on Monday, our edition, which I'm sure everyone was glued to. That we we've essentially we we heavily hinted that Croatia could do this and that Brazil were vulnerable, this kind of thing. And he- he- heavily, the old hint- scene, heavily, the old, heavily hinted. I that's what I'm going with. Yeah, yeah I'm I forget, I'm not sure how far we went down the road of it. Mm. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to amp that up now here. Yeah. While, well, okay, I'm going to amp up your pre-match uh, uh, feature that you wrote for the RT website. We quoted uh, Eamon Dunphy saying, you know, his famous quote, which pretty much put pay to anyone but the European team winning the World Cup. You need dictatorships and poverty to uh, produce great footballers. 2004, yeah. Yeah, and obviously it's since then, European, well, wealthy uh, European democracies have, have ruled the roost. <laughs> and they're, they're, it looked for a while there. Now, Argentina uh, and Brazil are both quite wealthy democracies too but your point was more you know their uh <laughs> their yunta pasts are more are, are in the more recent past i suppose um but yeah. thankfully as i said argentina are still in there because um and morocco obviously we're, there's nobody discounting morocco um but uh the uefa teams is it is it pure i i don't know what to put it down to like there's this theory that um Brazilian, you know, Brazil are quite happy to export promising footballers to, you know, Europe and take them back. And like their their own league is like the league for they almost good enough for Europe and that those returning from Europe. It, it shouldn't inhibit the national team, really. Yeah, there's a theory it, it, it should improve it, if anything. It should improve it. And, and so many of their players now, I mean, one of the differentiating factors of Brazil's teams uh from 20 years ago I mean 20 in 2002 I looked at the Brazilian team and the majority half the squad was based in Brazil but mm. the majority of the Brazilian based players were filling the bench I mean it, it was still the case for the final that the vast majority of the starting lineup was based in Europe the one difference from from now is that so many of the players currently are in the Premier League uh, whereas 20 years ago they tended to be in La Liga I don't uh, I don't know mm. whether that's a, a factor I mean I can't imagine it would be um, it looked to me like, I mean, I, you don't want to overread from it. It's ultimately a game against a very, a very tricky. The 12th and, best team in the world by ranking and beaten yeah, finalists four years ago. So a very it, tricky not, opponent with a huge amount of know-how and guile and experience and real mental toughness. You know, I, I you have to give huge credit to the Croatians and the, their ability to hang in these games. I, I don't, they don't seem to be as strong as they go, although they, they navigated two penalty shootouts four years ago as well before winning the semi-final extra time. So I to say it won't happen again. I mean, there's a fair chance at this point, I would say. Uh, yeah. And I mean, key to it is their, their midfield, I suppose. You know, I, I know people talked about Modric. I mean, one of the things that struck me about about Modric is, I, and I was trying to think what 
how do Croatia hang in these games? He does seem to have that ability to just alter the tempo of the game as Croatia require it as such because he never loses the ball regardless of the situation he's in he could be dumped in any situation and Croatia will hang on to the ball oh, and they're also the other 10 players know that if you're in a tight spot yeah even if Luka Modric is in a tighter spot give him the ball because yeah. he, he won there was one point in the second half where they did exactly that somebody gave him the ball when he was surrounded by about three Brazilians and it was just like a little shimmy and next thing he found a gap and he passed the ball off and as you say he does that time and time and time again but what i love about him almost more than anything not more than anything is passing so little the most but is he is such he's like a little terrier he's constantly sneaking up behind people and taking the ball off them because it's almost like the brazilians are thinking Modric, he's their neymar he's not going to tackle me or something like he's just going to stand in the number 10 position and kind of weight with hands on hip but like Modric is like over in a flash and nicking the ball off them like he's just Liam Brady was singing his praises and Liam Brady knows an awful lot about good progressive midfielders yeah and uh, yeah absolutely I mean and clearly he, he has to go down as one of the one of the greatest Croatian players and one of the great European players of modern times you'd have to say I mean it, I just I just I'm just struck by their the way Croatia, they were hanging in that game and they weren't creating a lot of chances. I mean, they barely shot on target for most of the 90 minutes. Then when they went behind, they were able to up it. And, you know, you could see Modric probing more aggressively, for instance. And then they found the goal, a bit of luck in the goal. But, you know, that's that's what they're doing. It's, it's striking to the extent that they've, they've played five matches in this World Cup. They've only won one of them, of course, which was against a, a very, I would say, naive and open Canadian team who they ran roughshod over. Other than that, it's been 2 nil all draws. Uh, one all draw with Japan, where they fell behind, and a one all draw with Brazil, where they fell behind, and they're still there. This is, they're, they're able to survive and advance through it yeah. all. Yeah. Um, it, it, and yet still... They're... It doesn't seem like they're grinding, their, like, but they are grinding their way through. But you know, we're not talking about nineteen ninety Ireland here, like this. You know, they, they are they're playing not fine. <laughs> they're playing fine. They, they're playing some fine football, and they're involved in some good I matches. Think, I, I, yeah, I think there's there's some limitations in the team in the sense that they they are a bit. They don't have a striker, really. Uh, yeah, they, they're essentially operating without a focal point up there, really. Which yeah. which will. I think we'll come to a head. So it's it's hard to see them winning the World Cup beyond doing beyond hanging in a final against. Yeah, you, you can't you can't win a World Cup without a marquee forward, or you shouldn't be able to. You shouldn't be able to, and and you, I, the only way they can win it, I'd say, would be hanging in a game against France and somehow getting to penalties. I would I would imagine they but tried I, that four years ago. Who <laughs> knows? I mean, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, no, you never know. Yeah, you never so, know. But I, it is. It's a remark. There's a lot of commentary on the size of the country. So I think it's a one million uh, smaller population than the Republic of Ireland. Obviously, you know they are one of the great overachievers. They're probably the greatest overachievers in world football. Nah, uh, Uruguay. Uruguay's population is three and a half okay. million, and they've won two World Cups. Yeah, but they won the first. I mean, the first one there was about ten teams entered it, and they hosted it. And you know, I mean, let's be fair here. I mean, you know, and then they won another one in, can, in Brazil. I. They won in 1950, yeah. Again, a very long time ago. I, I'd suggest 1930s is... is it's it's hard beyond to draw the statute of limitations, is it? It's, it's hard to draw conclusions. And 1950 is getting there too. <laughs> okay. Like, but... I would say, certainly football's greatest modern overachievers. And they're like, they've made three World Cup semifinals now. They got to the final after one of them. Their first World Cup was they entered was in 98. They formed the backbone of the famous Yugoslav team that beat mm. the quarters in 1990 and then looked to be very strong contenders for your 92, of course, before the whole thing kicked off over there and the, the country imploded. And yeah. then they go, they're out of action for a while, come back for your 96. And since then, you know, they've been phenomenal overachievers in world football, you have to say. And, you know, as they yeah. said, they're, they're they're a small country, but they're not going to surrender, as their manager said after after today's game. 
<laughs> always it, always good I, to bring in those militaristic overtones <laughs> undertones well, overtones it's probably it's probably overtones i was it a tweet there i believe it was adam hurry who might have tweeted you know people say croatia is a small country but what they're forgetting is that every one of those four million people is at least your europa league level a europa league level <laughs> it's true and as my wife noted today most of the women are super bottles and she's like why why are croatian men not as good looking as croatian women these are the oh, conversations well, I, i'm not going to get into hot button topics discussions like that but well actually you, you are photographers will have a ban and all to uh to... yeah no you are because i'm going to move on to tomorrow's big game the big game oh. at least in in terms of our near neighbors england v france and it is a hot button issue Do, England really need this win, don't they? Because the country is once more being torn apart by Harry and Meghan and their documentary on Netflix. Mm. I th- I think I think the old Lighty needs a they 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 do need a um, distraction. Have you watched it? Uh, aforementioned wife watched a couple of episodes last night. I I I felt nauseated and went to bed. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's 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 yeah, truly yeah. off. I can't imagine it being your cup of tea, Connor. No, I mean, I picked up some of the background noise on social media as one tends to. So, or I, the front pages of most of the English newspapers today. I don't tend to be. I don't tend to be scanning them anymore. But, but uh, certainly not uh, <laughs> like this. But well, you wonder. I mean, will it? Will will it disturb the peace of mind of the proud English footballers tomorrow night? It, I mean, this I is the brother of the president of the football association or chairman whatever yeah, yeah william is he's, he's something he's president or chairman will there be an extra charge to the way they sing god save the king tomorrow or okay. will some of them refuse to sing it in solidarity with the uh, or do some of them still sing god save the queen after a lifetime of habit i, I heard phil Foden still does that yeah i probably would too it's it's like it's like i still write 2020 I, like until february of next year i'll be signing 2022 when I when I date anything, you know, it's like some things just take a while. Charles, though, I mean, he gets a short enough time as king. Although knowing how long they live in that family, he probably has got twenty five years yet. But yeah, uh, I feel we digress. We have digressed. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, England uh, against France, their first ever meeting in knockout football. Connor, is that right? First ever. Uh, I've done a, a yeah a sort of. Yeah, most of what most of my talking points from this will be about here will be taken from the piece you've I, written. I, I, I assume tomorrow. you're going to spend this podcast, you know, telling everyone to read it and have. Oh, it is. It's, it, it is excellent, it's, and it's got a good headline too because I wrote that bit. But um, that took its lead from something I wrote. But yes, <laughs> certainly. Wrangles <laughs> here. No, I, what was the question? I, I hadn't got to the question actually, yet, but I, uh, but there wasn't really a question. I was just going to say. Big game, in it? Oh, extremely, yeah. First, I mean, it is actually. I recall now. It was the. It is the first not game they time they met in knockout football, which is surprising given you know two big footballing powers. I suppose uh, European neighbors, past World Cup winners. Um, yeah, they haven't met. They met in '66 in the group phase, which England won, mm. and they met in a World Cup match in. 1982, another group game, which England also won, uh, 3-1. Aside from that, there was a few, there was a three or Euro European Championship games, two of which were fantastically unmemorable, one of which during Graham Taylor's time as England manager. The other one which people will remember is Euro 2004, when uh, England were all over France for, well, it, all over them, but Wayne Rooney was certainly all over them and was terrorizing them. And then and Sven Goran Eriksson, in one of his classic moves, decided, you know, he there was too much chaos being created by this young man and decided to impose some order on proceedings. And France proceeded, <laughs> took took Rooney off, and uh, France proceeded to win the game 2 1 in the end. Much th- with great thanks to Stephen Gerrard and his rash back passes. Um, which he, he dropped David James in it and then wound up being a penalty and Zidane yeah. slapped you, you don't see Gareth Southgate taking off, you know, Jude Bellingham. No. He mightn't start Phil Foden, though, I suppose, which is kind of, which is almost the equivalent of, of at this stage, mm-hmm. taking off Wayne Rooney. He um, But, he you know, he gets a lot of stick for the teams he picks, but his record he, he has tournaments... A con- yeah, he has a conservative bias in these selections. Um, but, you know, they've, he, he has the best tournament record as England manager since... Al Ramsey certainly. Yeah, well, he did. I suppose the great question then will will be: Does he go to you know three at the back and play Kyle Walker as a right sided 
centre half, so to speak, and bring in Kieran Trippier, and yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, and maybe Linford Christie, and you know, a few others just to kind of tag Killian Mbappe and see how they get on. Well, there's, yeah, there's an obsession and a real fear of Mbappe because he's 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 on a different plane, as good as Bellingham and Foden are, and whoever else he is on a different plane to who everyone else on the pitch really, and so they'll have to. I, I, yeah, that that's certain, certainly something I'd imagine he'll think about doing. Um, mm. if it was he, interesting. If he leaves, if he leaves Kyle Walker all on his own, yeah, trying. Kyle, trying Kyle Walker doesn't Matty look. Cash, Matty Cash, the uh, Polish granny ruler, talked about trying to keep tabs on Mbappe like that, and there's some fantastic quotes. I think he said he burned my legs at one point. Yeah, he was very interesting. That he was very revealing. I suppose, like. You know, he's an English guy who had just come up against the guy who England are worried about. So he was in a great position to kind of steal the limelight for a minute. But it was very interesting what you said about Mbappe. Mbappe's briefing notes. Yeah. yeah. If what, like, what Mbappe does is he, he goes he fast and then he stops. He stops. And you have to stop. You have he knows to stop he can accelerate him. faster than you. Yeah. So yeah. Well, you're in an invidious position. And I, it's very hard to see how one, one fullback, uh, Kyle Walker, can can deal with this i mean you know i would wonder how he'll sleep tonight but i presume they you know i would i would think it'd be wise of Southgate to go to that now it's a big it's a big alteration to make for the sake of one player but i would say well it's not he is one player but he is the best player in the world so yeah. like if you're ever going to make a you know change your formation for somebody it might as well be the best footballer in the world True. who's, who's got five goals already in the tournament and just just looks absolutely terrifying um but as we said here, you and me with, with John Bruin, um, we did we earlier in the week. I'd have forgotten what day of the week it is. It's been a very long Monday. day. Yeah. Monday, I think. <laughs> it's Monday today, or it was Monday when we last spoke. Um, yeah, we, we did say that it's not just Mbappe, obviously, you know, they've got. Well, yeah. And uh, one of the big uh, pluses for France, I mean, I agree from the beginning has been absolutely superb and he's been redeployed in a fairly inspired move by Deschamps as a as a deeper lying midfielder given that he he was always a striker with Atletico Madrid and he was with France back in the year 2016 but um, he's just converted into this you know elegant uh, very clever busy midfielder and he's he's I think he's been super absolutely superb in this tournament and Giroud up front very humble uh a goal cart according to uh Karim Benzema who's not around the place but he's been uh yeah yeah a Rabio, a wonderful foil a mm. wonderful foil there and a very willing and and I, I suspect a very good presence around the team they feel the French a lot of the, the French often seem to depend on their vibes yeah, really they... the French are going to do from the vibes. You know, if the vibes are bad, they might flounce out early, and it'll be you know, and they'll be sullen going home. But the vibes look very good around France, and Giroud, in addition to being you know a fine um, uh, player and a very willing uh, worker, worker up top, uh, he's a great vibes man. I suspect in yeah. terms of his attitude around the place. And, yeah, uh, he, he's he's cer- he's certainly adding something there. Um, they're solid at the back despite all the injuries. Um, I don't know how do you, I, I know we had proper pundit well, uh, R- Ronnie Whelan on actually previewing these games yesterday, but I and I know there seems to be quite a lot of people leaning towards England now, but I I just I, I just think France have too many footballers who are supposed well, to at the risk of throwing too many. I mean, I've thrown one reference to Gaelic games in here, and I do know that. Uh, Galway Hurler, Damien Hayes, fantastic chap, was asked, was on a couple of different podcasts ahead of a league final a few years ago. And in one of them, he tipped Tipperary to win. And in another, the RT one, he tipped Galway to win. So I'm I, having tipped England very hesitantly on Monday, just on the spot. I'm going to I'm going to maybe revise that now and go for France. So I'm going to be right either way. At this <laughs> OK, it's a very hard one to go. Um, it's a Char- Charlie Hahi esque approach to punditry there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna slightly. I mean, you know, I have so many feelings and whatnot about it. I I think I, I'm appraising the two lineups in a very hard headed way. You'd say France just at the edge, but I mean, in, in a, I think it's it's so close and it's gonna be a. Yeah, I I suspect whoever. As good as Portugal were, and Portugal are kind of a, 
wild card in the pack. They, they hadn't really been considered as good as they are. I suspect whoever wins tomorrow will go on to another World Cup. I think this is this is okay. Cool. I'm pretty much done with predictions after today, mm. but um, on to the other game. Uh, if a lot of Irish people might, you know, be rooting against the English in some way, or at least not wanting them to win, you have to imagine a lot of Irish people are rooting for Morocco. Um, mm. They. Well, uh, they are building a historic run to the quarterfinals on a pretty stingy defense. Are they? They run a second round game on penalties. One of their group games was against the country with which they have rather, uh, you know, kind of long storied colonial history. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a Watkins Town roundabout in Casablanca, and I'd say it'll be the place to be tomorrow evening should they manage to beat Portugal. Yeah, we, we should send a reporter out there who's there, who's there. <laughs> went out there in 1990 to walk and we just, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, you say people are from Morocco. I mean, I find that with a lot of people, there's a bias towards the bigger teams ending up at the business end. But yeah, um, I I mean, it's hard to count to get, right, right off Morocco at this point. I, I was very taken with the manner of Portugal's dismissal of Switzerland, I have to say. And then, you know, they seem to, I mean, with Ronaldo not being there, I mean, the rest of the players seemed extra inspired, um, almost to thumb their nose at the big superstar in the corner. And, you know, they really flourish. Whether they can do it again is another, I mean, I you know, Morocco ultimately hung in that game against Spain. I know Spain were very sore after it, and there was a lot of ill-tempered quotes about Morocco offering very little in that game, which is a bit rich given... Yes, I don't think Spain really banged the door down. No, I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, I, I'm Morocco actually, had chances on the counter. Well. I, I'm I'm here on the uh, FIFA FIFA website looking looking at stats from that game. Um, oh, Spain had thirteen shots, Morocco had six, but Morocco had three attempts on target and Spain had one. So to say that Morocco offered nothing is obviously false. It's yeah. just they they adopted a certain style of play. Um, which might be favoured by, you know, some like Jose Mourinho and his acolytes. But, you know, you play with the strengths that you have and they've got two of the best fullbacks in Europe. Uh, they've got a really solid centre defence and I've they've got a couple of fast goals. I've only conceded one goal in four matches. An own goal. And the guy who scored it's injured, so they won't one, concede any more goals. One goal, including a penalty shooter. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so, yeah, they, I mean, now they're taking on a team who've just scored six. I, I mean, look, the instinct... I mean, and what the instinctive uh, thing to reach for is just to say that Portugal will probably win, um, which I still will ultimately predict. But I, you know, it's 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 one to be mindful of, and it's 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 you know, I it, you could tell. I I suspect uh, the football authorities were ex- overjoyed when Morocco won that shootout. The idea, particularly in keeping with you know the tournament going to an Arab nation to have an Arab nation in Africa. Obviously, the, it's a, it's a, or a Muslim country in mm. in, in Africa. Sorry, sorry, uh, qualifying for for this stage and the first one to do so, I believe, to get this far. I think that's right. Uh, yeah, it's in keeping with the spirit of the tournament, and it would, you know, obviously this this the European contingent have been quite apathetic about the whole thing thing in terms mm. of traveling. So. They'll be very grateful, and I'd say they'd probably, maybe FIFA are, are hoping maybe Morocco can go one step further and extend the fairy tale. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, if you know, it'd be it, we're waiting for an African team to kind of break the the quarterfinal glass ceiling, um, you know, after you know Cameroon famously Cameroon. Ghana, um, you know, they've got this far but not any further, and you know, you know, they've played Croatia, Belgium, Spain, and conceded no goals. The only goal they've conceded is against Canada. So it is quite a, a remarkable run they're on. Um, a group will provide two semi finalists if they can crack through tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true as well. We have to reappraise how dismal Belgium was supposedly were, maybe in light of this, given that they were in the group of the group of death as it transpired, which wasn't Spain and Germany's group after all. Oh, the other parallel between Morocco and the Italian 90 Ireland team is the granny rule. 14 of Morocco's 26 man squad are born outside Morocco and have Moroccan heritage yes um so you know it's another element um but were we 12 and out of 20 was it 
Oof. Italian, you know, so that's a, that's a stat I don't have to hand. I believe it was. Well, I'll have to speak. Sometimes I've heard it said fourteen, but it doesn't take into account that David O'Leary and Paul McGrath, though born in London, were grew up here. Yes. So. Um, we we've managed to make a good fist of preview in this match without talking very much about Ronaldo. I know you mentioned him at the start, which kind of, uh, which kind of ruined this segue. But no, we like we ha- he has to be talked about. You were just saying that uh, Eric Ten Hag quotes have kind of dropped on the wire there saying you know yeah. Ronaldo never told him he wanted to leave Manchester United until Eric Ten Hag saw the infamous interview um with Piers Morgan and now you get the impression that Fernando Santos is he's got the same well he he has a very woe betide kind of expression on his face all the time but it's like it's he's ashen face now and you can tell he's really not enjoying he's in a World Cup quarter final he's had a young striker just score the first knockout hat trick in about 30 years and he's fielding questions about a uh, stroppy substitute. He may be Cristiano Ronaldo, but like it does seem like this guy's ego is potentially going to capsize Portugal's, you know, World Cup campaign, which which in, in a lot of ways would be the perfect kind of ending to his like top, you know, top tier career. But it would be a bit unfortunate for a very talented Portuguese team. Yeah, absolutely. I, to, it reminds me, you know, to to have one manager lose the rag with you, that's unfortunate. To have two simultaneously indicates there might be a problem with you, which there clearly is with with Ronaldo's um, outsized uh, egotism at this point. It's, it's you know, it's. <laughs> I mean, it's at a level now which is almost he's incorrigible at this point. But I, I, as it happens. I know that I, although I say that he was, he seemed relatively diplomatic in at least in terms of his facial expressions and reactions throughout the Swiss game. Now it, it would have looked, it would have looked pretty, even by Ronaldo standards, it would have looked particularly bad if he was sitting there with the puss on him as Portugal rattled in goal after goal. You know, he couldn't really, no matter how much he might have wanted to. We've all read Eamon Dunphy's only a game back in the day where you're you're a sub and you're secretly praying the team does worse without you. Mm-hmm. Um, Ronaldo is unabashed enough that we were speculating where he, whether he might openly want the team to do worse without him. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, and it's, it is in danger. It's, it's really damaging his legacy at this late stage of his career you wonder how he hasn't had a degree of sense knocked into him at I, I actually think his ego has become like a you know a separate independent entity you, mm-hmm. you know to to Ronaldo I think there's there, you know uh, let's, so I'll get a bit deep here you know fight to 11 on a Friday night a Friday that will never end so I think I think before we're going we go, to psycho, we're going to get in dig- yeah before we get into well, the we're, ego we're and the psychoanalysis aid. here are we yeah no I think before we get into the ego and the aid we might call it a day in a word who's going to win this this one uh, Portugal okay did you say Morocco on an earlier podcast somewhere uh yeah I was on a Moroccan <laughs> show earlier uh I'd love to I mean I have I have. <laughs> I'm familiar with some strange dialects down there. I haven't told anyone in RTE that. But I'm available for any Moroccan shows. And I told them, I told them it was in the bag. Okay. In, in their own language. <laughs> I, uh, I'm just. What is that, by the way? <laughs> Moroccan, is it? <laughs> uh, French, isn't it? It's French, isn't it? It is French. Yeah. Um, strange. That's strange. Little. Local. Yeah, that, that little known language. I'm gonna be romantic and say Morocco are gonna win. And I can be proved wrong tomorrow evening. Uh, well, you always go with these outlier predictions. I mean, you have a long history of that, and it, it's you know you're you're. You can make a lot of noise about it when you're right, and nobody remembers yeah, when you're wrong. It. And when you, if you're wrong, well, I was just being you know daring anyway. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a romantic at heart. Um, okay, remember that you can watch both those games on RTE Two and the RTE Player tomorrow. Um, and sure, if they both go to penalties again, it's great value for your license fee. Um, it's late. What now. a day, though! I mean, oh my god, my head scrambled. Um, completely scrambled, which is our excuse if we missed out anything. When when Weghorst scored the second, I mean, I think in the apartment block here, there's simultaneous shouts from. <laughs> yeah, ah! it was not so much anti Argentinian, just exclamation, exclaiming in shock. You know? Yeah. Well, let's hope for more of that tomorrow. It has been a World Cup of, if not the highest quality football, a lot of entertainment, and sure isn't that what we want. Uh, Thank you, Connor, and thank you, Mikey, and we'll chat to you tomorrow. Good luck. Goodbye.